So the Dalton model of the atom, as good as it was, uh, it left out a few important details that we weren't able to figure out till a bit later. So that's what we're going to talk about now. So talk first about the Crookes tube. Now you should have hopefully watched this. Uh, I have a whole video where I demonstrated Crookes tube. You should stop and watch that now if you haven't already. But uh, um, we're going to talk about what that tells us. So it was developed, Crookes tube itself was developed by William Crookes. And uh, if you watch the other video, you know what it is. You basically have voltage source source sends uh, electrons through a tube and a magnet will deflect those electrons because they're charged. And J.J. Thompson uh, did not create the uh, Crookes tube, but did use the Crookes tube to deduce that there were electrons coming out of atoms and electrons, these tiny little charged particles. And so he uh, reasoned that, well, if the electrons are coming out of atoms, then they must exist within atoms. And so that was a problem because electrons are all charged and atoms are not all charged. If I, if I go and pick something up, <laughs> those of you who are watching this several years from now, guess what year I'm making this recording? Uh -huh. So um, the, this is how my students see me most of the time when they're not watching videos. So anyhow, uh, Thompson discovered that, that, that we had to account for these charged electrons because this thing, it doesn't, you know how electrons are static electricity, you know how it basically things shock everything uh, all the time. That's how electrons are, but they're not doing that. And if they're in here, we got to explain why. And so that's where, um, uh, that's where the next model, the, the first change since Dalton's model is going to come. And so um, the idea here is that uh, as we, I just kind of, push through those little uh, uh, addendums there, but uh, he concluded that all atoms must contain these negative charges, but we know there's no net negative charge, so because this thing doesn't freak out every time we get near it. So there must also be positive charges in here to balance them out. And so they had to come up with a model for the atom that explained how you could have both of these. And he didn't do it. Uh, William Thompson, also known as Lord Kelvin. We're gonna use his name as Lord Kelvin most of the time so as to not confuse ourselves with the J.J. Thompson confusion. But Lord Kelvin developed what we call the plum pudding model of the atom to sort of take make a way of looking at atoms that sort of explained all these things that we needed to have as part of the atom, but um, that still let us keep the things that we know are true. So he had this model of the atom. We still have our spheres that Dalton gave us. We still have the, the uh, heavy versus light. Uh, there are no protons now. There are no neutrons. All we have are electrons. And so what he said is where the positive charge came from was, he said the atom itself, the whole blue sphere here was positive overall. It was very positive. And all these little pink things, these little electrons, are inside of the positive sphere of cloud and uh, that they give it an overall balance of zero net charge. So the whole thing is neutral. You can, you know, it wouldn't shock you to touch it, even though the positive thing is in there and all those little negative things are in there, they're canceling each other out uh, because they're embedded through it. And we call it the plum pudding model uh, because this is a little bit like raisin pudding. Imagine raisin pudding, that little bread pudding with raisins in it. Uh, it's a little bit like that. We don't really eat plum pudding here in the U.S. so much, um, but I, uh, uh, I we usually talk about it as uh, the the way to talk to an American kid about it is we call it the blueberry muffin model. So the blueberries are like the electrons that are embedded within the muffin, and then the whole muffin itself is the positive part. And so. Uh, <clears throat> you might hear me call it the blueberry muffin model sometimes, but it, it was originally called the plum pudding model by Lord Kelvin. And this is our first major change in how we think about atoms since Dalton gave us the concept of the atom. And then we're going to uh, uh, summarize it that way. But it turns out that this is not the last we see of all the different models of the atom. And uh, even though the last one we're gonna do this chapter isn't the last one, but it's the last, we're coming up to the last 
uh, model of the atom, and that is the Thompson model of the atom. Um, oh, wait. <laughs> that, what am I saying? I just messed up. That is not correct. Uh, that's still the, I, I forgot there are all these slides. Uh, this is all the stuff I just said. Write it down if you want. But there we go. That's the slide I was looking for. Ernest Rutherford. He's going to give us, uh, this is the last part of this, uh, this part of this chapter where we learn about the history of the atom. And uh, Rutherford <clears throat> actually studied under J.J. Thompson. So uh, they knew each other. He was, Thompson was Rutherford's teacher. And um, uh, he noticed that there were these things called alpha particles. They didn't know what they were at the time, but he noticed that sometimes they got deflected by something in the air and uh, they weren't quite sure why. And so they decided to discover it, uh, or to study it rather. And uh, he devised the gold foil experiment. This is a pretty famous experiment, experiment of science uh, that you will probably remember about for a while. And so here's how it basically uh, worked. So you had a radioactive substance and it would shoot off these alpha particles we just talked about. And uh, they would shoot through this little tiny, tiny thin layer of gold foil, really, really thin, just a few atoms thick. And uh, then you had this uh, fluorescent screen covered with zinc sulfide. And what would happen is if an alpha particle hit that little screen, it would make a little light flash up. And so we could see where the alpha particles went. And so uh, the idea here is alpha particles are really, really high energy. So they should go right through. There's, uh, um, we shouldn't see these sort of, we shouldn't see deflections or anything. They should go straight through. And so uh, here's another way to look at it, a uh, different simulation. So we have, uh, here's, think of the lead block, the polonium source for, polonium's an element that shoots off alpha particles. And so we're gonna shoot alpha particles through this th tiny little layer of gold foil. So think of it like this. Think of it like shooting a, a, a deer slug, like a big, or a big shot shotgun shell through uh, at a piece of paper, or a piece of Kleenex or something, you would expect that it would go right through. And so the screen here is to uh, allow us to see what would happen. So we expect them to go straight through without changing direction because the positive part, remember this, what we're doing is we're kind of looking at that plum pudding model of the atom. We're seeing if it was right. So we had this, I we had this idea, the plum pudding, we didn't say it so much, but that positive charge spread out over so area so much area made it not very dense so it's kind of like a spongy like foam like you should be able to punch right through it um so they shouldn't be able to stop an alpha particle based on what they knew at the time so we expected whenever they would shoot this little uh alpha particle for it to go straight through and for only uh a flash to happen right here at the edge and the reason for that is because this blue, this positive part of the atom is all spread out and kind of uh, not very dense and you should be able to just punch right through it. So we can see that visualized again. This is the expectation. Just go straight on through. But in fact, what he did get and can remember the way to think about this is this is like a, a shotgun and this is a piece of tissue paper. You see. <coughs> Weird stuff. When you shoot a uh, shotgun at a piece of tissue paper, you do not expect uh, for the uh, shot or the bullet, if you're shooting a bullet, to uh, um, to deflect, or you certainly wouldn't expect it to uh, come back at you in any way. So that didn't make any sense at all. So what this told them, this is completely unexpected, and this told them that the way that they were thinking about the atom was wrong. So since um, so they came up with this idea. This is it in words. It's going to say it in a picture here in a second. Um, they figured out that it, since most of the things went through, it had to be empty. The atom was basically empty. But every once in a while, there had to be something hard enough, heavy enough in the center that it could deflect. Uh, and so it had to be small and heavy. So it had to be very dense. And they gave this dense little piece of the nucleus. And this doesn't make any sense. Just wait. The picture will help explain it. So. Here's the idea. Under the plum pudding model, you expect those alpha particles to go straight through. Uh, but under the uh, nuclear atom, see how we take the, the whole positive part of the atom is not spread out anymore. Now it's all 
contained in this tiny little nucleus. So as the alpha particles come through here, most of the time they go right through. But if you should be lucky enough to hit that tiny little heavy dense thing, you're going to get a deflection. And we can actually see that uh, um, on a, a simulation that we have here. So here's a simulation. Here's our gold foils. We're going to see a uh, bunch of alpha particles come through. And you see that the average alpha particle is not going to hit one of those tiny little nuclei. So the, the nuclei that are the positive parts that will bounce it off are these tiny little dots in the center. And so um, most of them will go right through. But if one of them comes in and happens to hit one of those tiny little nuclei, it will be deflected. And so that was the idea. This is the way that they explained that experiment. And so um, that gives us uh, the summary. So that is our last, the Rutherford atom. Um, sometimes we call it the nuclear atom. Sometimes we'll even call it the planetary atom. That You might remember that graphic from the beginning of the first video with all the little electrons going around. Uh, that's kind of the beginning of the, uh, it's kind of Rutherford started all that with the idea of the electrons were, were we didn't talk about the electrons, but the electrons uh, in this model are going around the outside of that nucleus. And it's really, really tiny. That nucleus is unbelievably tiny. It's hard to process how tiny it is. So the way to think about that is if this entire atom, if this entire uh, circle here that we see that is an atom, if that were like the size of a, a big football stadium, soccer stadium, baseball stadium, like uh, um, <clears throat> uh, then, then the nucleus would be the size of like a tennis ball down in the middle of the field. And so the, the nucleus, the mass, the mass part of the atom is concentrated in this tiny little nucleus uh, in the center, and it's almost completely empty space. The atom's almost completely empty, and so that is the, uh, that's the Rutherford atom, that, that nucleus, that heavy part is real little, and the rest of the atom is really big. So this is not drawn to scale. The nucleus would you would barely be able to see the nucleus if this were drawn to scale. And so just give you a quick summary of all the models that we went through here. We had the Democritus model, which wasn't really a model at all. Why? Well, because he just made it up. And then we had Dalton came along and uh, gave us the first modern atomic theory where atoms of different elements differed by weight. Why? Well, because it, it explained all of the experiments that they were seeing. Uh, then we had Thompson uh, uh, or Kelvin, Kelvin came up with the plum pudding model because he needed to explain uh, how the charges existed within the atom uh, because J.J. Thompson uh, told him uh, that electrons existed. How, how could that happen and it still be stable? And then finally, uh, Rutherford came up with the nuclear model and the reason was because he needed a way to explain the gold foil experiment and how those alpha particles usually pass through, but every once in a while they would bounce off. And so that's a quick summary of all the different models that we've been through. And that is actually the end of the historical uh, development of the atom for now, but don't worry, it'll change later this year. Ah, oh, no, it's too big. Oh, no, we don't want all that. What's going on?